All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so what I wanted to do today, um, uh, hopefully we, we can get through um, all of what we want to get done today. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about a, a field of psychology that is purely, purely applied. Uh, so we've been talking about different areas of psychology that, um, you know, forensic psychology and uh, health psychology, educational psychology, but uh, community psychology is another um, applied type of psychology that uses uh, a lot of psychological principles to help solve societal issues. Um, so I have my, uh, my PhD and I have a master's in community psychology. And when I was going through trying to determine, you know, what my degree would be um, and what I wanted to study, um, I read a description of community psychology and absolutely fell in love with it. And it's a field of study that um, is really interdisciplinary. So, uh, you know, I have a background in business. And so it really doesn't matter what field you come from. Uh, community psychology has a way of uh, being able to connect uh, with that particular field. So, um, you know, many, some of you are uh, criminal justice majors. Uh, so community psychologists work very closely with um, cr the criminal justice system. I mean, we work with, you know, the police, police force and law enforcement to create um, different uh, procedures and policies in order to better police the neighborhoods that, they, that they're a part of. And so we, we do a lot about um, and with, um, you know, police brutality, um, training for uh, police officers, um, police culture, all of those things are really important. And so community psychologists work to help, not only help the individual, um, which we'll see, um, but also help the system um, where people are living. Because if you can help the system, and if you can change the system, the policies, um, the, the societal uh, constructs, um, you can help to heal and change the person. Um, so when we think about uh, mental health, um, you know, more often than not, you're going to think of somebody who is a, a psychotherapist, somebody who's going to be a counselor, who's going to sit with somebody one on one and give them um, treatment. Community psychologists feel that in order to help a person, um, you first have to look at their environment. And it's not to say that you should not go to counseling or therapy, but the environment that we live in, the backgrounds that we, we have influence um, our mental health, influence our physical health. And so we, we work with the system um, to create better structures around the person to help uh, improve their well-being and their lives. Uh, so that we'll talk about a lot of the concepts and how how community psychology was founded um and then and then we'll move on any questions before i get started can everybody hear me yes sir okay all right yeah i get you all right appreciate y'all all right so let's get started so today what we're going to talk about um we want to determine the difference between what we call prevention uh, and treatment. And there's, a, there's a, a, a contrast in those two things because one of them is trying to be really proactive and the other is being reactive. So prevention is um, proactively trying to solve a problem before it begins, right? So if I know people are um, not experiencing good drinking water, right? then to prevent that from happening, I need to go and figure out what the problem is before it becomes even a larger problem. And again, treatment is more reactionary. So we treat people when we uh, have diagnosed them with an illness or diagnosed them with um, an injury, right? But how do we prevent that, right? So many of us were athletes. So how do we prevent injury, right? We have to train, we have to lift weights, we have to stretch. We have to hydrate. All of those things are prevention to, uh, you know, tr trying not to get injured, right? So the best athletes prepare themselves before they get in the game so that they're preventing injury, they're preventing uh, any overusage of muscles. Uh, they're doing the, the necessary things with their body. Um, an athlete like, uh, say, Tom Brady. Tom Brady played 20 plus years because he was able to prevent injuries more often um, than other athletes, would, right? We'll also look at, for number two, just looking at the differentiation between interventions that bring what we call short-term 
versus long-term changes, right? And so the short-term changes are those ones where we're interacting specifically with an individual trying to uh, influence them specifically and heal their, their situation. The long-term changes are those structural changes that we try to make uh, with policy, with procedures, uh, and it's, it's all structural. So how can we influence the greater, greatest amount of people for the longest amount of time, okay? We'll talk about the layers of community intervention. So we'll talk about the intervention, uh, the individual, excuse me. We'll talk about you know the, the second layer, which is kind of uh, the community. And then we'll talk about society at large and how those layers influence people and influence uh, the individual in a, in a major way, right? So we're not just living in a vacuum. Um, our communities influence what we do. Um, and then society at large influences the community which then, which then uh, influences the individual, okay? And then we'll focus on uh, community psychology has some competencies. It has some, uh, some things that we use as, as, as practice practitioners to help and uh, to, to get, give our work meaning um, and to give our, our work some, uh, some, some, uh, some, some direction and what we wanna do with, uh, with community members and uh, uh, with, with, with whomever we're working. Okay, so when we think about and talk about um, community psychology, you have to begin with the beginning, all right? And so um, when you think about uh, psychological disorders, you know, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, uh, OCD, PTSD, um, uh, autism, all of these different disorders, eating disorders, all of these disorders uh, have and can be treated um, through uh, what we call the medical model. Right, and so the medical model gives us an opportunity to diagnose, um, to determine what the cause is with the etiology, and then also to um, to determine what the prognosis is. And the prognosis is, you know, how will this uh, how will this illness play itself out? Right, is it something that's really really severe, or is it something that we can use therapy um, or counseling to kind of help you cope with it? Right, but again, the traditional treatment model for mental health is the medical model. So you come into the office, you know, you, you, we ask and probe questions. Um, you know, we try to diagnose you with a specific uh, category of mental illness, and then we try to treat you um, just kind of the similar way that we treat a physical injury. So if you came into the doctor uh, and you rolled your ankle and they, they would, you know, check the mobility of your ankle, they would determine if you had a high ankle sprain or a low ankle sprain, they would give you some, you know, anti-inflammatory medicine. They wrap you up, compress your ankle. They would send you on your way, tell you to, to you know, elevate your ankle and, and stay off of it, right? Same thing with uh, the medical model. With the medical model, however, it focuses specifically on the individual. And so for community psychology, community psychology feels that, you know, it's not wrong to focus specifically on an individual, right? But there is, uh, the, the, there's a community, there's a societal thing that's around the, the person that can help and perhaps help prevent injury or mental health or any other ailment uh, in the community. So an example of, again, working uh, in the individual with an individual focus, like I said, a clinician is delivering that one-to-one -one therapy to kind of influence the person's perception, behavior, and thoughts, right? So it's psychotherapy, they're working with them, trying to determine and help them through um, whatever their mental issue is. So community psychology goes beyond the individual focus, right? So we're looking at culture, we're looking at the economics, we're looking at political environment, um, we're looking at in the kind of the international influences and how those things can promote and how they influence the individual. We also promote change, positive change, health outcomes, empowerment at the individual and what we call the systemic levels, right? So we're not just looking at helping just the individual. We're looking at helping and changing and morphing uh, the social environment, the cultural environment, so that it's influencing the entirety of not just one person, but the community at large, right? So we're looking to see if there are any disparities in healthcare, are there any disparities in education, in income? And so how can we use you know, our social influence, our, the culture, the economic to help 
and the political specifically with policies uh, and uh, legislation, how can we change legislation to help empower individuals to improve their lived outcome, right? We use a strength-based approach. The strength-based approach is very different from um, the medical model, right? The medical model, model focuses on illness. It focuses on the deficit, right? But the community psychologist is working to, to, to look at not just fixing the deficit, not just fixing the, um, the illness, but how do we build uh, competencies? How do we build skills? How do we build a system or a, an environment to help to mitigate um, some of those, those issues, some of those deficits? So we're not just into fixing the person. We're into fixing the system that the, that the, the person lives in to help the person um, live a better, a better, a better life. So back in like the 1960s, right, um, there was a movement that was beginning to take shape and take form. And community psychology is, is really, really new. Um, community psychology kind of started its way around 1965. And it started its way at what we call the Swamp Scott Conference, right? And this was held in Swamp, Scott, Swamp Scott, uh, Massachusetts. And the reason these individuals met is because they felt like Helping just individuals and the medical model that has been has, has been used for you know the last century or so was not all inclusive, right? It wasn't inclusive enough of everyone, and it didn't help. It was more reactionary and not proactive, right? So they felt the need for an additional avenue to to solve some of those societal problems. So you know, civil rights or uh, the the drug problem that we have in communities. Um, again, educational issues that are happening in, in some of our communities. Uh, and again, we're looking to see what can we do? So about 40 people met at this conference and they were able to determine that community psychology and psychologists would need more of a, a, a holistic and ecological kind of framework to, to solve problems at a, at, a, at a bigger level, right? So those societal issues that we talk about, we're able to solve them in a more holistic way instead of just focusing on the individual. And it's not, again, nothing wrong with focusing and working with individuals, but there are systems in place um, like racism and sexism and ageism that influence us in a negative way. And so how do we, how do we change those systems, right? In order to serve people uh, and give people a better outcome um, and lived outcome, okay? But the outcomes of the conference, um, after they got done with this conference, again, those 40 people met, after they were done, they determined that, you know, there were groups, right, that were underrepresented, right. So when we thought, think about think about the civil rights movement, there were there was limited access for African Americans and people of color in certain fields, and even what even more so in psychology, right. And so they wanted to expand services to groups who were underrepresented, and expand the reach of psychology and other fields of study to those who are underrepresented so that people feel welcomed, right? So, you know, when you're selecting someone as a physician or selecting someone as a, uh, you know, a, a counselor or a therapist, you want someone who looks like you, right? And so we wanna make sure that we have representation at all levels for all races, for all ethnicity to help individuals, um, again, uh, heal and, and operate in their best way, okay? The focus for uh, community psychology specifically is again not just on treating the person because again again that that is reactionary right the focus more so now is on prevention right and we don't just give and go to the community and try to try to change and uh, you know fix the community no we're not trying to fix the community we want to involve the community members in the research in the work and empower them to help make the changes on their own right so we are giving them the skill set. We're giving them, we're giving the work back to them so that they feel empowered enough to make the change. Because when you give work back to people and you make and you allow them to do the work themselves, they they buy into it a lot more and the change is a little more lasting. Right. If we just came in as researchers and wanted to fix the issue, right, then we wouldn't see much of a change. We would see a change, but it wouldn't be as as big of a lasting change as we'd like to see as if we were giving the work back to people, okay?
So there are three um, guiding principles. Um, and, you know, these themes uh, are identified throughout the field of community psychology. And, and then one of the reasons why um, I chose community psychology as a, as a, a field um, is because of these three uh, really common themes, right? So it's the prevention, right? Helping and preventing things from happening in the community. So mental health, uh, physical health. So we work really closely with the mental health community, community mental health. Uh, we work really closely with, uh, you know, uh, health department and, uh, you know, all of those different places. We work really closely with education and criminal justice, right? So we are in a lot of different fields, sociology, anthropology, um, social justice is a big aim, right, of community psychology, right? So we, we get out and we hit the streets and we try to solve community and societal issues through social justice reform, okay? And then the ecological perspective, which hits on, we live in a, what we call an ecosystem, right? And when any part of the ecosystem is uh, transformed, hurt, or damaged, it affects everybody in the community, right? So if one group in the community is, uh, and does not have clean, clean water and, and, and great facilities, right? It's gonna influence everybody in the community eventually, right? And so we look at the, um, the community as an, an, e an ecological an ecological, ecological framework, excuse me. And so we, it's all an ecosystem, right? So we're trying to figure out how can we change the system in order to help people um, to, to better live um, the life that they, they, were, they were created to live. Okay. Right, so when we think about prevention, okay? Prevention is just that, again, we're trying to go upstream to figure out and stop problems from happening, right? That is prevention. Again, and that's why members of in community psychology met at Swamp Scott, right? They were like, we have, we're treating a lot of people, right? We're treating a lot of people for illnesses. We're treating a lot of people for a lot of the social issues that we're seeing. And we need to find the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? And how do we work with community members to stop the problem from happening, right? That's prevention. We wanna be more proactive instead of being reactive when we are helping community members and working with those in the community, right? So I'm passionate about education. And so when we have students who are coming to school as freshmen and then in their second year, they don't come back. So retention is really, really low. How do we prevent that from happening? What do we need to do on the front end? What do we need to do within that first year to ensure that we have more students staying at school, right? What are those issues? What is the root of the problem? And we need to, again, work to identify that root. So when we see it, then we can address it and start to change what's happening in the community, right? So again, that's just an educational framework, right? But it could be in, uh, in healthcare, right? So in some communities who have uh, poor drinking water or lead-based paint. So there, there was a, uh, there was an apartment building where children in the apartment building were getting sick, right? And they were coming to the hospital and they were testing the kids to see what was going on. With them. You know, they had, you know, low, low weight. Um, they had a fever, they were sweating, uh, they were trembling, they had diarrhea. And so they were struggling with something, right? And so the doctors, went in, they did all the tests. And what they, what they found out was that these kids were being exposed to lead, right? Lead, and they had a high, uh, a high incidence of lead in their system, right? So the doctors were like, what, where are they getting this? Where are they getting exposed to lead, right? So they had individuals go into their apartment complexes and go to environments where children were, in the school system and in the apartments. And they found out that some of the, the houses and many of the houses, especially built before 1950s, had lead-based paint, right? And it was making children sick. So what happened was they, were, they had to go in and remove the paint. So instead of just treating those, those kids that were getting sick from lead poisoning, they went in, they prevented it from the beginning. So the next generation of kids didn't have to worry about that, right? And that is, again, identifying the root of the problem. And then, again, working with the community members to solve it so that it stops it from happening. Right. And that's that's why we have, uh, you know, regulations in place now to 
um, for certain paints, for, for certain chemicals, so that we protect community members from uh, from those harmful and toxic um, substances. Okay, so when we think about prevention and when we think about change, there's two different types of change. There's a first order change, and then there's a second order change. The first order change is minor changes that kind of leads to small short-term improvements, right? That's the short-term stuff we're working with individuals and we're trying to, again, put a, a fix on whatever the issue is, right? So we're focus, focusing exclusively on the individual, right? So again, when those children were coming into the hospital, I'm just gonna fix that one individual student or that one individual kid, try to heal them, and I'll get the next person that comes in, I will, I will heal them, right? Especially, and if they come in with the same illness, I'm just gonna keep healing them. We're gonna keep treating them, keep treating them until they get better. And again, that is just working on, and those, those are the small improvements, short-term improvements, right? So this is that direct intervention. But what this does not do is it doesn't have an effect on the environment. So we're just fixing the person. We're just treating the individual. We're not getting out and looking at the context, right? And we're not looking at the root or the cause of the problem and we're not changing, right? It's not being changed, right? So again, this first order change is just that. It's just changing kind of the person. The second order change, this is when we bring change about the system. It's the environment, it's changing the structure. And so this goes beyond, again, just the individual. This is looking at the root. What is the root of the problem? How do we fix the root of the problem in order to kind of affect the larger community? Right. And so this change that we create in this second order change, it persists over time. Right. And it prevents societal problems. So, again, with the lead based paint, they were able to get in, scrape that paint off, repaint, um, move the paint out of the out of the apartment buildings and out of the schools uh, and out of almost every structure that had lead based paint. And that prevented a lot of the illnesses, um, the, the lead based poisoning that children and other adults were experiencing. Right. So that prevented an entire societal problem right there by, again, changing just the, the, the paint that's being used uh, in buildings and in other, other structures, okay? So I'm gonna read you a story. Um, and this is kind of a, an idea of what we use. When I was in uh, graduate school, this is a prevention story. Um, and so it kind of shows how we, you know, use prevention to go upstream. It's about going upstream to determine what the issue is. And when we talk about going upstream, that means we're looking to a little further up the road to look at the root problem to see um, what that problem is, okay? So it says, imagine that you're standing uh, by the shore of a swiftly flowing river and hear the cry of a drowning man. You jump into the cold waters, you fight against the strong current, uh, you force your way to the struggling man. You hold on hard and gradually pull him to shore. You lay him out on the bank and revive him with CPR. Just when he begins to breathe, you hear another cry for help. You jump into the cold waters yet again. You fight against the strong current and swim forcefully to a struggling child. You grab hold and gradually pull her to shore. You lift her out of the bank uh, beside the first man and revive, work to revive her with CPR as well. Just when she begins to breathe, you hear another cry for help. You jump into the cold waters again, fighting again against the strong current. You force your way to the struggling woman, but it's too late. Despite your efforts, the current is too fierce and she drowns. Now you're getting really tired, but with great effort, you're able to pull yourself back up to the shore. That's when you hear another cry for help. Near exhaustion, it occurs to you that you've been so busy jumping in, pulling people to shore, and applying CPR that you haven't had any time to go upstream. So what's causing everyone to end up in the water, downstream in the first place? Desperate to catch your breath and potentially stop because of the problem, you walk upstream. Shockingly, you see the bridges upstream are in various state, states of repair, along with the river. I mean, like along the river, excuse me. It says some are strong, made of sturdy components. Other bridges are weak, and debilitated with missing boards or flimsy railings. It doesn't surprise you that most of the people falling in, in the river 
are crossing the poorly made bridges and those individuals that live near or travel across the strong bridges are protected. Of course, all the bridges could use more reinforcement, but it's easy to see which bridges needed most attention. In this parable, we know that certain groups of people are more likely to fall in the river than others. However, they do not fall in because of individual weaknesses or intrinsic flaws. Rather, we know that some people are privileged to live in communities with strong bridges, usually made of high quality materials that protect them from falling in the river and promote their safe passage across. Okay, so this story tells us about, again, a situation where there is a structure, a bridge, or several bridges. You got a strong bridge and stronger bridges. You have some weaker bridges that are that are need are in desperate need of, of repair. And it's those bridges that need repair that has been causing individuals to fall into the river. And sub, you know, unfortunately, one has drowned. All right. What other issues? What other issues can you think of that we may need to go upstream to try to solve? Think about any any world or societal problem. What other issues do you think we need to kind of fix and go upstream to solve? Somebody help me out here. Think about the issues that you, you might see in the news. Think about uh, maybe the issues you see on campus. How might we go upstream? What other issues um, could we use this, this parable for? Somebody, somebody help me out. Could you use it for... Um a shortage of parking spaces around campus you could you could right so what what issue is uh not having enough parking spaces causing causes um people that live in certain dorms not to have a place to put their car and if they do have find a place to park it's usually uh far away from the dorm and they have to walk alone at night or something like that. Okay. Okay. Good. So you say, so, so you think about maybe we have a, you know, sexual assault on campus, right? And yeah, having parking closer, that's, that's definitely, definitely a, a mitigation, a prevention to uh, having individuals having to walk so far. That's good. That's good. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's get back to it. Okay. But again, that's, that is the premise, right, behind uh, what we think about when we think about change and prevention, right? We go upstream, another issue. So it said that uh, in the last part, it said that the issue is not really specific to an individual, right? It's not the individual's fault, right? When we think about homelessness, right? When we think about individuals who are experiencing homelessness, many people, like to blame the victim for their plight and for what what's going on in their life, right? When you think of homelessness, many of the homeless, many of those who are experiencing homelessness have been struggling in certain ways and, and certain issues and have certain issues. Um, a great majority of those who are experiencing mental health issues, those are the ones who might be struggling with schizophrenia or some other major depressive disorder. Right, mood, mood function, mood, mood dysfunction, right? And so with them not maybe having uh, the right, the, the, the great amount of income to pay for things, or, you know, the housing prices are really, really high. So it's making owning a home or having or finding housing really, really difficult for those who don't have it, right? So that is just perpetuating a, sy a system or a cycle of homelessness for individuals, right? So some of the things that we could do to help with individuals who are experiencing homelessness is provide them with the mental health care or the physical care that they need, right? Or again, helping to provide affordable housing for individuals who may be 
um, maybe experiencing homelessness, right? Those are things that we could do to prevent some societal issues like uh, homelessness, right? Because again, it's not just the individual. We can't just blame the individual for their uh, their plight, right? There are societal things, there are structural things in place that also are uh, hindering individuals from um, from moving and, and progressing in life. Okay, but again, first order change. Just some, some examples, right? Lifeguard diving into the water to save a person who fell in, kind of similar to our parable that we just we just uh, read. And then the second order change, installing railings to prevent people from falling from the cliff and teaching the others on the beach to swim to prevent them from drowning, right? So those are second order changes, right? I'm teaching individuals, I'm empowering individuals to be able to handle the water better. And I am installing structures in order to keep the individuals safe. Another one, right? So intervening uh, to prevent teenagers from engaging in tobacco use, right? The positive outcome to this is prevent some teens from smoking. So we prevent some, right? But think about those who we don't reach, right? It doesn't change uh, the, the fact that they have access to it. How, do they, how are they getting access to the tobacco? How are they getting access to smokeless tobacco, right? So there's convenience stores who sell to minors in neighborhoods, right? So how do we change that? The second order change would be to enforce penalties and strictly, strictly monitor convenience stores that sell tobacco to minors, right? So not only does this help some teenagers, but it also is gonna prevent others from engaging in early tobacco use, right? Just by, again, going upstream, looking at the structure, looking at what, um, what, what kind of policies are in place, and then enforcing those in order to help more people, right? And help them for a longer period of time. All right, so here's a, a brief activity. I want you to think through this, okay? Give me an example of one, okay? It says, can you think of another example of a first and second order change you have encountered or participated in, okay? How do you decide which one is, or which uh, activity is a first order or second order change? Somebody give me an example of a first order change and a second order change that you have encountered um, or, or participated in. Somebody give me one. Um, probably getting in the bars and clubs underage as a second order. Okay. How would you, so how would, so the, the first order is, um, turning, turning young people away, right? What would be the second order change? Like how, how would we how would we create that as a, to be a second order change? Um, with like the ABC going into the bar and seeing if checking people's IDs to see if people are underage. Okay, good. Right. So it's identifying what the problem is. Good. Thank you, Cole. That's about again. We have an issue with uh, a lot of bars letting underage people in. Right. So again, just like with the tobacco, tobacco use. So now we monitor the bars a, lot, a little more closely. We check IDs a little more closely. And again, we, we use those policies and, that, and we, put, we enforce stricter uh, penalties for those who are allowing individuals who are underage into the, into the clubs and the bars, right? So it's looking to find out, again, what the issue is, right? Because we do see uh, a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of younger people getting into bars and drinking underage uh, and experiencing things that, again, are sometimes detrimental for young people. But then that second order change is using policies, using uh, different structures uh, to help mitigate the problem um, a little more upstream. Okay. So we talked about prevention. Okay. The second uh, common theme for community psychology is what we call social justice, right? And social justice and the orientation of social justice, we're really wanting to assist people, um, assist groups uh, who have historically been marginalized and oppressed, 
right? So we're looking at those who are disenfranchised, those who oftentimes don't have a seat at the table to make decisions. And that social justice arm is that fair, equitable allocation of resources, opportunities, and power in a society, right? So, so for a very long time, you know, way back in, in the civil rights era, right? Um, Martin Luther King, other civil rights activists like Malcolm X were looking to help to level the playing field and provide fair, equitable allocation of resources to people, right? People of color, brown people, right? And so we needed more power and we weren't given as much power. And so now we are given a little more power, but we still have so much more to go because there are still marginalized people uh, who are living in lower income neighborhoods, who are, are oppressed in some ways and are not living up to their fullest potential, right? So when we talk about the social justice uh, orientation, it's about looking at what the issues are, right? Um, looking at, again, police brutality, looking at um, uh, mortality rate, uh, pregnancy mortality rates in, in you know, African-American women, looking at the opioid crisis in lower income communities, right? All of these are um, the, the fentanyl um, issue that's happening in a lot of lower income communities, right? So we have to look at some of these issues and again, look at our equitable resources being uh, applied to certain groups, right? If one group doesn't have clean drinking water or their, their air quality is poor, then how do we fix that? Because that's not equitable. Because we have some communities who have better, better, better schools, uh, better roads, better water, better air. We have to make that more equitable, and we have to create opportunities for uh, people to be um, to be better. Right? When we think about social change, right, it's not enough just to simply recognize the inequities in our in our community. Right. We have to work towards the, the social justice, right? So while we think about social justice and we talk a lot about, you know, those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, we also have to think about what are we gonna do, right? And it doesn't have to be anything big. There are what we call small wins, right? And I think we talked about this a lot, uh, a little bit yesterday when we were talking about the idea of success, right? Success is not a, an end goal. Success is every day you wake up. Right and decide to to go to class or decide to go to work or decide that you're going to uh, push forward right in reaching your goal right that is success in and of itself we all we all have successes almost every day right you all just showing up on Zoom today that is a success right and so even with social justice the social change that we see even the smallest changes right are successes and are helping helping us move toward the final goal in creating equitable allocation of resources, fair, and creating a lot more power for those who are marginalized and oppressed. Okay. So when we think about uh, the research that I, I do, that I love to do, um, we kind of orient our research and our action uh, around uh, equal distribution of resources, right? So, uh, you know, and it's not just equality. Right. I believe in equity. I believe in sometimes there are some individuals in our society who need a little more in order for us to level the playing field in the right way. Right. If we have a group of individuals who have been marginalized for several years, then it's important that we give them the necessary resources to, again, reach a level that is kind of equal to everyone else around. Them, right. You also want to reduce barriers to resources. Right. So. If I have food deserts, right, and I have individuals who don't and lack transportation, in order to reduce those barriers to them getting high quality food, let me create a transportation system, right, into that community so that they are able to go or put a grocery store in their community to reduce those barriers to those particular resources. Uh, obviously, fair and equal treatment and promotion of self determination, right? So I want individuals that we help to be empowered to solve their own issues, their societal issues, not just me. I don't wanna be the, the problem solver. The individuals who I want to help, they are the problem solvers, they are empowered, they have the power 
um, to change their own lived situations. And when they can do that, then the, the situation they're in can change for the better for the, for the longer term. Okay. And then the last piece um, for uh, those, those, those three orientations is the ecological perspective, right? So again, we talked about the, the traditional medical model, which they, they diagnose, they look at the cause of it, and then they give you a prognosis of what the illness is going to be like, right? The, to go beyond that is to think about the holistic and the context of the person and what, what context they need. So we're looking at going beyond just treating the individual, and we're looking at a more holistic observation and examination uh, and how we're going to act to solve the issue not just solving and helping to treat individuals who have depression, but what things are happening in their community, what things are happening societally that are creating them to have, or, or ha giving them, creating opportunities for them to be depressed, right? So we need to look at society, we need to look at the communities, and then make those and draw those connections, right? Because we know that individuals and their environments are interconnected. So if we can understand how they are interconnected and understand how their behaviors are shaped, then we can change it, right? So if we know that people are struggling with, uh, young people are struggling with tobacco use, right? Underage tobacco use, right? Now we understand that there's an environmental thing happening, right? They're struggling with tobacco use. We know that and we see that, but there is something else happening. So how are they getting access to it, right? So that's the environment, that's the community, right? And then societally, what are we doing and how are we, um, how are we marketing um, e-cigarettes and smokeless tobacco to, to young people? Is that something that's being, being done inadvertently, right? So we're looking at the community, going to the convenience stores, and then looking at some of the, the marketing and the ads and everything that we see on social media and on TV, right? How do we change those from enticing uh, young people for wanting to do that? So again, we're looking at the perspective and there are two principles that we look at, um, the interdependence and being interconnected and then how do we shape and how do we change individuals to um, create a better lived outcome for their, um, for their families and for uh, the next generation, right? So again, we wanna identify what are those social environments and how they affect, affect uh, and influence people, okay? And so here's just a diagram um, of uh, Kelly's kind of ecological theory, right? You got interdependence, you have adaptation, you have what we call cycling of resources, which is uh, kind of a process in which you develop resources that can, can help and, and develop the community. And then you have succession, right? So there is process of change and it's continued change and continued adaptation to different issues that happen, right? So what our ancestors uh, experienced and problems that they experienced, um, we may not experience in the same way because again, the changes and the problems do change over the course of time, right? So we have to, again, we have to adapt. We have to adapt our problem solving skills, we have to adapt our critical thinking skills in order to change problems uh, that we are facing in the 21st century um, versus what they, they were experiencing in the 20th and 19th century. Okay. And again, like I talked about before, Again, those three levels of influence. You got the individual, you have the community, and then you have the society. And each of those uh, systems, right, uh, is a part of that person's behavior. So your behavior is influenced not only by your community, um, but it's also influenced by society at large, right? Your community can involve your family, it can involve your neighbors, involve, you know, those who are kind of in, in your immediate circle. And then society at large, those individuals that, again, those, those structures that are in place, the policies, the procedures, right? So if we think about um, you as an individual student, right? You fit as an individual student, the community itself is Alabama a and and then society is outside of Alabama a So everything that affects Alabama a and then also affects you, right? So again, it, it's a, a ecological or ecosystem. Right, so we're all affected by something that happens in one system or the other. Okay. Uh, some other principles, and we'll, we'll kind of zoom through these. I'll highlight these here. Um, but you got respect by diversity. Um, again, we 
really honor di diverse perspectives. Uh, we honor diversity and ethnicity and race. Uh, we just honor the diversity of people, right? The uniqueness that everyone brings to um, to the to the table, right? To the classroom, right? Uh, we uh, active participation uh, in people who are in the community, right? So community engagement is really really important. Um, grounding research and evaluation, interdisciplinary collaboration, and so we'll look through each of these briefly, and I'll and then we'll get out of here. Okay, so when we think about respect for diversity, right, um, we want to include and have inclusion of all people, right, especially those who have been underrepresented throughout history. So for those who have not normally had a seat at the table at, in making decisions, we want them to have a seat at the table, right? When it comes to um, research, we don't want to just be the, the, the practitioner that comes and does research on those who are disenfranchised, those who have the issues. We, again, we want to provide opportunities for those who are underrepresented to have a seat at the table so that they're making decisions for themselves, right? And as community psychologists, we're going to work with individuals from various walks of life, um, various situations and circumstances, from uh, socioeconomic to race to ages, uh, different abilities. Right. But again, we're honoring um, and respecting their diversity. And we know that the diversity that we all hold. Right. I'm a I'm a cisgender black male professional. Um, and again, I and that identity is how I that's my that's my diversity. That's a part of who I am. That's part of my identity. Each of you has a distinct identity as well. And that informs how you behave, that informs your worldview, that informs your uh, your values and your morals and everything that you are is based on your diverse, your diversity and how you identify. Okay. When we talk about active citizen participation, right? Again, we want to help the individual build the skills necessary to really make the change on them for themselves, right? We want to provide them with a voice and we want to help them to really help define their own issues so that they own, they're providing their own solutions, right? So they build those skills and then they're able to provide their own uh, solutions to the problem, right? So we shift the power from being really uh, top down where the, the researchers at the top and the, the, particip the participants are at the bottom. We wanna make it more holistic and more flat where everyone has an equal sense of involvement. Right. So we want a high level of involvement from the participants and we want the community to be involved with the community psychologists to make the change uh, that we want to see in the, in the community. And again, the people have to be able to identify the issue. Right. Like we talked about before, helping them to identify the issue then helps them to journey for the solutions that they need. Right. So they have the resources. And if they don't have the resources, we provide them with skills so that they are able to help provide. Because they have, again, we talk about we're the, the diversity, right? We want to expect and respect their point of view, their perspective, so that they're helping in the process to change and provide solutions for their issues. Okay. But again, it's all about collaboration. Um, it's all about partnership. Um, and so, again, with being a community psychologist, I'm all about, again, giving the work back, right? I want to hear from the people. And that's why in class, I ask, you know, what can we change about the class? Because again, it's important that you tell me so that I can give you the best experience, right? It's good to have uh, your point of view um, so that I can understand where you're coming from and understand what you need as a student. Okay. Um, when we talk about research, Myself, I'm a big evaluator. Um, I love to get in and see what impact think what systems are having on the person, right? So we get out in the community. Uh, we like to go and, and involve the community in our research, and then we like to evaluate to see what's happening, what are the interactions to determine what community interventions are being successful, right? So we're going to be doing a few things on campus this, this next semester, this next school year, academic year, and I'm going to be helping to evaluate to see what the what what has been successful, right? Were the workshops, were the 
uh, the different issues, the different uh, policies and procedures that we implemented, did they make a change on uh, student success? That's what we want to see eventually uh, and see if retention uh, increases as a result. Okay. Um, you know, we've all taken, you know, research methods and we've taken statistics, uh, but we use uh, our action oriented research methods approach. We use both all three methods, qualitative, quantitative methods, and we also use uh, mixed methods as a result, right? So qualitative is really um, kind of about words and collecting data is kind of comp the, kind of the descriptions and words, right? And then quantitative is more empirical. Um, it's talking about numbers. And then the mixed methods is a combination of the qualitative and the quantitative uh, data collection methods. Right. Um, some benefits of uh, evaluation. Um, so when I was in grad school, uh, I did my dissertation on, uh, I did an evaluation of a preschool um, to see if uh, the kids that were participating in that preschool had, uh, had higher academic achievement than those who did not. And so I was able to provide useful information to the school system to determine if what they do in the, the classroom for those young people had an effect, right? And even, and if I can determine, if they can determine what benefits they see in their preschool, they can then go out and get uh, additional funding uh, for, the, for the things that they're doing for their, their preschool, right? So I was able to kind of help with the evaluation process to determine their effectiveness uh, and the benefit they've been providing to not only their students, uh, to, the, to the, the parents and the family of those students. Okay. Uh, again, we're big in, as community psychologists, we're big in interdisciplinary collaboration, right? So, you know, we work with members of uh, public health and education and criminal justice. Uh, we work in mental health and community mental health. We work in the medical fields and uh, in the environment, right? Environmental justice. So we work in those different areas to understand uh, barriers in a broader way, right? Uh, it also helps us to understand the different perspectives. And we use, um, in criminal justice, we use some of your theories to help explain some of what we want to help and, and change and solve, right? And so we share the resources. Uh, we, pr we, we pr you know, promote kind of shared understanding between uh, and amongst, you know, stakeholders. So criminal justice majors, and psychology majors, we want to be really interdisciplinary and be able to help, right, understand communities better through different lenses um, uh, from different fields of study. Okay. Um, sense of community, right? Um, you know, the sense of community is defined as kind of your perception, right, and your similarity to others, right? This gives you um, you know, giving others what one expects from them, and it kind of gives you a feeling of being a part of a larger, larger, excuse me, dependable, stable group, right? So I'm hoping that uh, many of you as students here at Alabama a and have a sense of community and have developed a sense of community, right? Uh, I know Cole had mentioned one time that as, uh, uh, you know, criminal justice majors, you all have, have formed a, a, a sense of community, right? You all come in at similar times and you all take you know much of the same classes and so you build this sense of community and having that sense of community helps when you have maybe uh, an issue right maybe you're struggling with a class but somebody has taken that class before and you're able to get the the, the necessary help right so many social issues that we do see begin and worsen because of a loss of connectedness right so if you did not have that sense of community and you felt like you're kind of in this um on an island, then it would be more difficult for you to kind of be successful as a student. But that, now that we know that you have a, a larger sense of community, we're able to provide uh, and give you the necessary resources to help you move through um, when you do have an issue. Okay, uh, sense of community um, again is provided to again is positively related to uh, quality of life, um, community satisfaction. Uh, your social climate and your well-being, and then educational quality, right? So again, if you have a high sense of community, you're going to have a high quality of life. Um, your student, your student, and the way you feel as a student is going to be higher. Quality of, of how you value your education is going to be better, right? So that's what we want to create at, at the university, provide you with systems to create a higher sense of community. Okay. 
Um, here's a true false. Okay, it says an intervention, and here's a question for you. It says an intervention would be considered unsuccessful from a community psychology perspective if it increased students' achievement test scores, but fostered competition and rivalry that damages their sense of community. All right. So think about this question: Is this would, would this be true uh, or false? Again, I'll read it again. It says an intervention would be considered unsuccessful from a community psychology perspective if it increased students' achievement test scores, but fostered competition and rivalry that damages their sense of community. Is this true or false? Read it over and give me, give me, give me your idea. Any ideas? Okay, so if you think about this, okay, we talked about sense of community. Sense of community does have a benefit and it's positively related to academic and just success generally for people, right? But the one thing that we don't wanna have is we don't wanna damage someone's sense of community, right? By creating rivalry or competition, right? So this would be uh, false, okay? Okay, one of the other things that we talk about is empowerment. Um, empowerment is how we, um, and it's kind of a process in which communities and people who have historically not had control over their lives become masters of their own affairs, right? So we give power back to them, right? And we allow them to, to have a voice, right? We, have, we give them a voice, we give them a choice to make decisions about their own life, right? Um, we recognize as scientists, professionals, that we're not just, again, the, um, the end all be all, right? We, we might be the experts, but experts can, negatively affect the community if we don't allow them, uh, the members, to really solve their own issues. So we want to collaborate and we want to help the community members understand their, their power that they do have. We want to give them a voice. We want to give them a choice so that, they're, they again, they are the masters of their own affairs. That is the number one key, right? We want to empower the community and make sure that they're getting everything that they can um, out of their experience, okay? We want to give them the, uh, the autonomy, we want to give them self-determination. We want to give them access to resources, right? So if we have some, some families in our communities who uh, are unaware of uh, low cost uh, mental health resources, we want to provide them with the access to that, right? We want to let them know that there are resources available for those who don't have higher income. So they're getting the, the necessary resources and help that they do need. And we want to make sure that they are uh, participating in uh, solving their own community issues, right? We want to empower them. We want to give them, again, a voice and we want to give them a choice to kind of uh, help in mastering their own uh, community affairs. Again, policy, again, we talk about policy a lot. That's the legislative, uh, the executive and judicial branches of government. We want to bring change at the local community and societal level, right? Uh, as community psychologists, we don't just uh, try to look at society. We want to look at what are the what are the legislative things that are happening in our communities that are influencing us, right? And we want to try to influence those laws and those regulations to influence the person at a larger level, right? Um, so when we think about um, you know uh, tobacco use and underage tobacco use, what are those laws and those regulations that can be implemented in order to better help uh, teens from being exposed to harmful substances like that? Um, when we think about um, gun control and gun laws. What are, those, what are those laws like and how are they influencing our community? So how do we change those, right? How do we influence them in a positive way so that we're saving lives uh, and influencing uh, people in a, in a more positive way? Uh, one of the last things that we talk about is promotion of wellness, right? Um, so well, wellness um, is not simply just the stereotypical lack of illness, but it's a, a combination of physical, psychological, social health, 
and it includes your personal well-being and your attainment of your personal goals, right? So when we talk about wellness, we're talking about the holistic person, right? We're not talking about just you feeling good. We're talking about you feeling good physically, you feeling good mentally, and do you have the proper social support around you, right? Do you have the proper social support um, around you to help you become your best self, right? And when we talk about collective wellness, this is a groups of people and communities are well. So when we have individuals who are well, then we have communities that are well, and then everybody is helping to reinforce the wellness of everybody in the group, right? So we want to promote wellness, uh, not just at the physical level, but at the psychological uh, and the social. Um, but again, to sum everything up, right? Again, we go beyond, as community psychologists, we go beyond just the individual focus, right? We integrate um, social, cultural, economic, political, environmental, and international influences to promote change, right? Not just uh, not just the first order, order change, but that second order change that, again, is longer lasting and is long term, right? And we're driven by, again, various values, uh, various principles like, again, prevention and, you know, thinking about uh, the ecological perspective, right? All of those things are helping us to uh, guide and guides our work. It guides our research, it guides the, uh, the work that we do in our communities, uh, and it helps uh, when we are able to empower individuals to help solve their own issues. Okay. Any questions? Any questions at all? I'll stop sharing so we can get it. Any questions? All right, so I want to remind you 